I feel like such a jerk. You know what I did? I started the stream as a private stream because I've been doing some testing with the sound. Now I'm hoping the sound is going well. And I'm hoping that the sound is going really well with the synchronization with the camera. Because what I did was I had to muck around with how many milliseconds delay or advance. And it's a whole lot of mucking around. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's going well. I was going to turn the stream off then and start it again. But let's see what's happening. So we've got a few people in. Uh, if you can let me know if it's going well, that's great. AV, okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Carl. All right, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Now what I'm going to do, give me a second. I'm going to open one of the boxes up, shut another box down so that hopefully the stream comes through extremely clear to you. Um, and while I'm doing that, don't forget to do these, <laughs> these things. Give me a second, where are we? I need to pop the chat out. There it is. And then go over to this one here and just set it to that. And that should be fine. Close that one down. This is all stuff I should really have done prior to starting the show. Advance that up a little bit so I can read it because I'm old. There we go. Uh, volume a little low. Turn it up at your end. See how it's going. But if you need to turn the volume up a little bit, that would probably fix that for you, Michael. Peter, morning, uh, Dave, and all aboard this time. Wayne Jones, g'day all. Right, and there's a few other people, Ian Kerry, g'day, and Dave M for Dave Monet, I'm guessing, hello. Now, I don't know if you caught what I said right at the beginning of the show, when it was private. <laughs> I got a real kick. I woke up this morning and checked Facebook, and one of the guys that, uh, Richard, I think, uh, put a little post on one of the pages and said, Dave, um, Ron Polk did a video on you last night. And I think, what the? So I had a quick look, and I, I was very embarrassed. <laughs> I started blushing, even in my own home. So there you go. It was, it was amazing. Uh, I thought you pulled a sickie, Mr. Stanton. Oh, well, there you go. Sorry about that. Um, Jim, g'day, Dave, from a hot Geelong. That's no good. Now, I hope, as I said, I hope the picture and the sound is good. The sound should be syncing with the camera, and we're going to do one test. I'm going to walk down the end of the workshop, and if the sound is still good, it means that the walk around mic is still working very well. I'm down now at the Arthur's workbench and coming back up and coming back into the frame. Now, did you miss me? <laughs> How'd that work? Yes. Oh, Craig. Uh, Ron's a really nice guy. Now, he's, uh, he did make comment. He, he got something wrong in that video. He just said that... Uh, the workbench that I built was the second best. I think he's misguided. I think he thinks his bench is the best. His is a really nice bench. So either way, they're different styles. His is for full on inside a garage if you just want to hit it and take it with you. Mine's a much smaller device designed for, you know, if someone's using it inside their home. So there we go. You can get both of them. Okay, audio is great. That's thanks, Peter, Carl, perfect. Excellent, Dave, working good. Hello from Wisconsin, David M. Matt, loud and clear. That's so good. Oh, wasn't last week a debacle? Now let's not dwell on last week too much because that was that was terrible, very embarrassing. So I'll tell you what I did. I had someone say to me, Dave, so you don't do it again. Paint the microphone plug with red lipstick. Now what I did, I did that, and so when I plug it in, it goes straight into the microphone socket. I'd actually plugged it into the green one, which is for the speakers idiot national idiot of the week award goes to dave <laughs> all right now what i say at the beginning of every show is the beginning of for people that haven't watched the show this runs for an hour maybe i'll go over a little bit the first 10 minutes to half an hour depending on how the chat's going is probably going to be full-on chat and then maybe a little bit of showing um, some viewers projects and we're doing a little segment at the moment which is animals in the shop so that's what's going to be and some interesting things from the week now here we go straight off interesting thing from the week what do you think of that that is a four gang powerpoint with conventional where is it there these two guys here whoop back there we go this one it's really hard when you're looking upside down there those two these two guys here they just plug or you just screw this powerpoint onto where an existing powerpoint is or GPO, General Power Outlet. Obviously that one's for Australia with the um, 
active and neutral and the earth pin at the bottom. Uh, but you know, often I get to a point where I don't want to run four kettles. You know, if I was to put four kettles into one power point, well, I'm going to trip, trip the breaker. But if I've got some battery chargers, brilliant. This thing is great. Rather than going to have to get another power point or general purpose outlet uh, plugged in beside it. So that can be a little bit tricky. A lot of people might say, oh, you know, you're going to overload the circuit without anyone realizing it. You know, if you sell the place, someone will come along and think, oh, yeah, I can plug all sorts of things into it. That's not what it's about. You know, I understand that. But, uh, you know, I thought it was a pretty handy idea. And look, this cost me $29. I love it. So for my cameras, I'll just plug them all into that one power outlet and they'll all be together charging together. So that's for me. For batteries, for the um, drills and you know jigsaws and nail guns and what have you, the shears up there, this will be great as well. They should handle all the current. Now, let's see where we are. Let's see where I'm going to have a quick look in the chat. Um, Coming back down through it, working good. Hello, Dave from Wisconsin, Matt Dowden, loud and clear. Matt, uh, super good sound. Jamie Gorman, g'day Dave, a bit warm, but bearable in Canberra. Uh, John, the sound is excellent. Thank you so much, John. Craig Health, lol. Uh, <laughs> yeah, idiot. Uh, Sue B, good morning, all hello from sunny Florida. Mark Bongus, morning all, how is it in Holland or the Netherlands, Mark? James Gavas, Gavax, hi Dave from Buffalo, New York. Paul Hill, morning Dave. Peter Lisiak, how are the fires up there? They're not really they're not really an issue anymore. We had about 65 hectares burned out around about eight kilometers from my place. As the crow flows, crow flows, as the crow flies, uh, that's the saying, you know, direct line of sight, from my place to Warragamba Dam is probably around about 10 kilometers straight through the bush. There's a lot of mountain range in between. Well, you know, for Australia it's mountain range. For someone from Switzerland, it'll be a slightly undulating plain. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the fires were in between me and the dam. So there's plenty of water there for the choppers to pick up if they needed to, to dump water on that fire. So I wasn't overly concerned. The wind direction wasn't pointing back towards my place. It was blowing away from me. So we were pretty comfortable. There, there, was, there was a lot of fires burning in the state last week. Uh, been very, very hot. Right. Uh, next one. Matt, Just I've just met... Uh, Good. David, the microphone, not your nails. Yeah, I'll tell you, I got a little bit. I got a little bit just there. And I thought maybe I should do one nail and just get everyone guessing. <laughs> um, Leroy, reading morning or Jim Carroll, thumbs up. Michael Christopher's got four of them around the walls of my workshop. Well, you're ahead of me this time, Christopher. Uh, Michael. Sorry if I got your name wrong there. Sorry, Michael. Um, and and thank you for trying to get that stuff to me this week. But next week's fine. Whatever you want to do, buddy. It's all you. It's all about you guys is what I mean. Uh, Zane, morning from Canberra. Doug Marriott, morning Dave from the not-so-sunny town of Orange, New South Wales. Here's an interesting thing. Last night, apart from Ron doing this thing, you know, which made me super embarrassed, I ticked over more than 40,000 subscribers which is another little milestone. They, you know, these, these things are coming along and I'm getting so excited about it. Now, to give you an indication of how many people that is, that is more than the total population of Orange. So there you go, Doug. Uh, all the people of Orange, that's how many people subscribe to this little channel. I, I still get amazed every day I see it. John, there's a, there's a get good point with USB ports as well. I might have to have a look into that one, John. All right, now we'll read through all of this run sheet for the day. See, I make these little things and it tries to keep me on the straight and narrow. We've gone 10 minutes into the show. Uh, I've checked the stream is running well. Uh, we'll talk about the items that happened today. All right, what, what are we going to do today? Um, I've already talked about the sound should be better. Now polish to the rescue for the sound. Uh, dressing Australian hardwoods, I'm going to run a piece of 12 inch Jarrah through the thicknessing machine today as well, because as I said, I've got a few pieces of timber over there that I've been working on over the last couple of um, shows. Some Northern Silky Oak, some um, Red Gum, and today is the Jarrah. Now this is a really, really nice, very dark Australian hardwood uh, from Western Australia. <clears throat> it used to be so common, they built railway sleepers, you know, they just cut up for railway sleepers for railway line. 
Well, I guess that was before they had anything like concrete, which they do, do them all now. Uh, what's the next thing? Um, I have an itchy, itchy nose. I don't know why. Maybe it's the bubbles in the lemonade. All right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? So we're going to do that. Gluing and setting plasterboard. I've got the plasterboard set up there. I put a second coat on that joint that we did last week. And today we're going to put the top coat on, which is another product. And I've had to muck around with the settings on the camera that I've got set there. Ah, he. Because if I show you, and I will do, I'll show you what it looks like with the camera that's on me at the moment to the other camera. And I've had to set the levels down big time on that one. And whilst I'm traveling down through all these levels, I'm getting flicker all over the place. I have to find a happy medium. Anyway, I think I've got there. Uh, so hang around for that. If you're interested on how to do a bit of gyp rock around the house, if you want to do a repair at your own home. Um, chat and more if I can squeeze in. The first half of the show is generally chat. Come back in 30 minutes for demonstrations, which is what I've said. Um, and also here's a big one. This is a tip from Grant Dale on how to align your sliding table on your saw. Now, I don't have a sliding table on my cabinet saw because it's not a panel saw. Mine is a cabinet saw. It has mitre slots, which I have made a sled and I've got another sled and I've got a couple of other things that I use, mitre gauges, to present timber to the blade at different angles. So I present the timber to the blade at a different angle. I can present it at 90 or 45, wherever I want. Now, with a sliding table, you've got it a sliding panel saw, you've got a big table that slides past the blade. You know, it's very close to the blade. It may only be, you know, a mill or two away from the edge of this sliding table. With saw stops, it's going to be a little bit further away because their sliding table that they make hooks onto the edge of the main body of the table saw. So it's going to, um, it's, it's a fix that uh, Dale did. And I'll read his fix and I'll talk and I'll actually show you in a little bit of detail further on down the show, but here we go. Grant Dale, sorry. Grant Dale, hi Dave, just thought I'd follow up to let you know I managed to solve my issue with aligning the crosscut fence on the sliding crosscut table of my saw stop. I was put on this method by some guys on the woodwork forum. There are a couple of videos on YouTube that demonstrate the method for a crosscut sled, but the method for the saw stop fence is pretty much identical. It relies on simply using a dial indicator fixed to the table and then holding a large engineer square against the fence as the fence against the fence of the on the um, sliding table now as the fence is pushed past as you slide in the table along the fence will affect the dial indicator so you just keep on loosening off the the fence and bring it round a bit until the dial indicator is going to be tracking the same right the way that down the length of the square. Now I've got a rafter square, which is 600 by 450 millimeters. So it's close enough to two feet by 18 inches. And I'll show you how that can work. I haven't got the dial indicator out, so you'll have to give me a minute or two while I set things up, but you can watch while I do it. I don't have a sliding table, but I will use my mitre gauge and I'll show you how easy it is. And he says here, Grant says, um, uh, where are we? Ingeniously simple and very effective, quick to do, uh, quick to do too. And no messing about destroying forests with the five cut method. <laughs> the, the dial indicator I've been using is the same one I've seen you use in some of your videos. Uh, just thought I'd mention it in case you wanted to pass the info along to a broader audience. Well, I do, Grant. Thank you so much for that. I love my dial indicator. Incidentally, I just found out the saw stop have redesigned the mitre gauge on the sliding crosscut table and now includes detents at every 15 degrees. They obviously listen to all the customer complaints. <laughs> the new mitre gauge can be bought as a replacement part for the old fence. It is available now in the US, but not expected out here for about three months as far as I've been able to determine. Thanks again for the advice and keep up the great work with the videos. Well, thank you very much for that, Grant. And uh, hopefully, that's going to help a few people out as well. I put a little line through something when we've had the chat. There you go. See the line through there. Next thing, next thing, next thing. All right. I'm going to have another look at the chat. So there's a little bit, a tip. Things like this I throw into the show. And if you want to run with it, that's great. If you don't want to hang around for the moment, as I said, be another 10 minutes or so before I get into the demo. Um, I'll see you back then. Here we go. I'm going to have a quick look. 
And what have we got? Okay. Phoebe Clark, or is it is it is it F H E O or F H O E? I better ask Steve. Maybe he'll be able to tell me. Uh, that's a little in joke from the um, Facebook, the Dave Stanton live stream Facebook page. If you want to come in and have a look at that, I think there might be a link in the description box down below. It's a um, I'm the bouncer at the door, so if you've got things that are uh, that not suited if it's a pornographic site or anything like that i don't want to know about it you know this is this is totally for people that just want to chat about um things that happen on the show and suggestions to help other people out um all right where are we now phoebe morning clark and all the way all from thebes and brenton in melbourne looking forward to another show uh nigel roberts hi dave just getting into woodworking and i'm finding your videos very informative very much uh, helping me get started. Cheers from Gisborne, Victoria. Thanks, Nigel. Did you see the video I did last night on the grippers? Aren't they a great little bit of kit? Now, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know they're plastic. Now, what isn't plastic these days? These boxes up here are plastic, I, but I love them. You know, not everything in there is Festool, by the way. You know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Rockefeller. There's, there's all sorts, this is my Bosch circular saw inside a festal sustainer it's just i use their boxes they're very very handy i've got all sorts of things in there i've got um i've got a bosch multi-tool in one down there i've got the safety gear in another one down there i've got cables in another one you know they're very very handy they're regular shape and i'm sure other companies do a similar thing you know by all means dewalt bosch everyone does them but these ones i love uh because they work with a whole lot of stuff that i already have uh, where are we up to? Nigel, uh, I've already just said that. Marcelo, hi, good night from Brazil. Good night, Marcelo. Uh, Matt's Woodland in Germany, we mostly use sliding table saws. Yes, yes. Now, that's the thing. Most of the European saws, <coughs> pardon me, most of the European saws are a sliding panel saw. But as I say, in America, they're all cabinet saws. Now, don't ask me why that is. I don't know the history. Um, but, you know, that's what we use. I'm just seeing here. What do we got there? Peter, Dave, I thought you were into the Jessam products. How come the gripper now? Yes, Jessam is very, very good, but it's restricted in how narrow I can go. Now, with the Jessam stock clear cut stock guides, I can put something through there comfortably, probably around an inch and a half wide. If I go down thinner, the they're just a little bit too big. The, the nature of the beast, the wheels are going to be a little bit too big for me. So the micro jig stuff, I can put, it's got a quarter inch fence on at the moment. I can go down to a one eighth of an inch thick fence on it. I'll grab it. And I'll show you what I mean. I haven't got, I don't have the one eighth fence with me. And by the way, the one that I put together last night uh, and threw up on, on my channel. See, this is the little fellow here. So the one that I put together last night is a 200, but I set it up as a 100. You don't have to put everything else on that makes it the 200. Now, if you buy the 200 and decide not to put everything on, as I say, and put it, make it a 100, it's cheaper than if you want to just buy the 100 and then the add the 200 accessories on later on. It's always more expensive to buy things in parts. So I advise people, most people, Get the 100 it'll probably be fine for you if you need all the capacity that the 200 has buy that off the bat straight off the bat it's going to be cheaper in the long run but i find that most of the time this is all i need now one of the other things that i was doing in the on the video last night i was showing this sitting on a piece of four inch by one inch in australia we say the wider width first than the, than the narrow so four by one six by one uh, ten by ten by one ten by two all that kind of stuff you guys in the States obviously do it the other way around. You work on the thickness of the stock and the dimension of the width. Now, I had it set like that. So if it's a skinny piece, you utilize this side foot to stop any rocking. If it's a wider piece, you undo these, slide it all the way up to there. And then this guy is totally out of the way. See what I mean? So I could have a really wide piece out here and the gripper is holding it. This part here is this, the area that I'm talking about. See there? That's a quarter inch wide. I can buy one that is one eighth of an inch wide. And then 
that will hold extremely thin stuff going through the table saw. So that's why I wasn't using the clear cut stock guides, which are just fantastic. All right, I'm going to keep on reading. Uh, Michael Christopher's, do table saw riving knives need to be metal or that can they be some other material? They can be timber if you want to, Michael. It's just that metal um, has a little bit more integrity. You know, it's just it's for the size, the skinniness. Um, well, then, you know, I, I, I like that one. It's, it's steel. I, if I wanted to, I've got uh, a plywood insert there and I could, if I wanted to, put a hardwood um, riving knife into the insert and glue it in perfectly in line and that'd be fine. All right. Uh, Zane, do you have a crosscut miter sled? Yes, I do. I have a, um, I've got the Rockler miter sled and I, I've done a, uh, a video on that. When I bought it, I wasn't all that happy with it because there was too much wobble. But then I did a little bit of a workaround and I show you how to do it. And now it works beautifully. It's a lovely sled. Uh, Carl, although they're usually steel, I don't know why you couldn't make them out of something else. Only a matter of durability. Correct. Um, okay, Zane, I went to Makita Mac Packs. Really good when Sydney Tools have a special on. There you go. Jamie Gorman, the gripper surprised me how good it is. A must have for every workshop. Yeah, they've, they've got all sorts of attachments that you can throw on the gripper. And, uh, you know, obviously it's someone who's got a very good idea and he runs with it. Now, the only thing that I can say about any of these products that have got this anti-slip on it, and this goes for my the Stanton bench as well. If you get dust all over it, it's, you know, obviously it can't get a grip. Now, I try and use dust extraction wherever I can. And if you've got a small dust broom, like I, I can Keep one of these, lovely color. <laughs> I keep one of these around the shop. I've got, I've got a couple of them. It cost me about $1.60 for that and the pan, you know, at, at Bunnings. You know, how do they make something like that, ship it from Asia, put it in a store, turn a profit, and pay the staff? I don't, I don't, I don't know how they do it. Anyway, I'm digressing. That's what I, I you know, fixed. That's not a problem. So there was a gentleman had made that comment and I understand what, where he's coming from. Totally get it. But if you've got a broom, you know, just clean them up. What's the next thing? I think that's about it. So let's jump in. How many people have we got watching at the moment, guys? I'm not watching the results of the channel. I'm not watching the thumbs up. If anyone's doing the thumbs up, that's great. And if anyone wants to subscribe and if anyone wants to have a look in the description box down the bottom and take advantage of what we do down there. And I'll let you know that I am um, affiliated with uh, Amazon and miter set and there's a lot of people are and basically if you purchase something from amazon through one of my links it helps the show yeah that's all there is to it no more mentioned next thing stuart west okay now stuart is an interesting kind of a character <laughs> he sent me a picture in when i asked for people to send me in pictures of their animals in the workshop so here we go uh there we go uh there it is now, this is not a real animal, as you may well guess. Uh, hi, Dave. I thought you might like to share the photo of this little hippie chick that pops into my workshop. I'm not sure whether it's a she or a rather a gay he. It doesn't seem to like bird food, but loves a handful of rivets and a little dish of WD-40. Sometimes sharpens its beak and trims its claws on the bench grinder. I've once found it hopelessly drunk after indulging in my metal polish. But it really does have a magnetic personality. <laughs> All the best. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's great, Stuart. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now, what's the next one we've got here? We've got Debbie. Debbie has been watching from her place. And let's have a look here. I'll do a quick call, <coughs> quick read on this. Hi, Dave. After a relaxing breakfast in the courtyard, sitting watching the show and putting my X carved together, I cast the stream to the big TV through my phone and watch the finer detail and chat on the laptop. Really appreciate the time you take to share your knowledge, Debbie. And back to this one. <clears throat> Again, I need... Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay, so we've got Stuart and Debbie. And the last one we've got, it's a little bit of a, uh, a bit of a slideshow that I put together. And this is Hilton. So Hilton Bond up in Gove in Arnhem Land. Uh, 
I'll read a little bit after I get it started. Here we go. <clears throat> Hilton and Marley. Um, my dog Marley guarding the workshop is very protective and keeps strangers away. Now also, these are handmade jewellery boxes that Hilton made prior to Christmas. Now aren't they absolutely beautiful? What a talent. And he's made a stack of them. Good on you, Hilton. There you go. Now that's your moment in the sun. And Hilton has just purchased a whole heap of machines and he sent a whole heap of photos and he's popped them on the live stream chat as well in uh, Facebook. If you want to have a look at some of the stuff there, by all means jump in. I'll see if I can get some of the things together in the next week or two. Now I reckon we're ready for a demonstration. What do you reckon, guys? Um, Hilton, hello. I'm all I'm running late. I hope I haven't missed too much. Well, Hilton, you just walk straight the door onto your part. So that's excellent. Only 21 thumbs up. Deary, deary me. <laughs> that's okay. I'm thick skinned. I can take it. All right. What are we doing next? It is the, we'll start with the Jiprock. Now I'm going to switch cameras. What I'll do is, first of all, is I'll turn this camera around and you can see down there, there's the Jiprock that I'm going to muck around with. Now there's no definition there, is there? But if I switch to the other camera, you can see, you can, you can actually see the difference between, I'll make sure I bring this over here as well. You can see the difference between the setting compound and the sheet. Now you notice my hand is extremely dark there and the bench top is extremely dark here in comparison to this. Now this is basically the color that I am and the color of the bench top. And we're going to be using this stuff, which is, this is the topping coat. Final finish topping compound. And I'll take you back to the other camera. And hopefully the sound is all working. Now the same as the other week, or last week, this stuff you need to take out with a smaller um, spatula. So I, I use this. I don't use the broad knife to, to dig it out. Now this is still only a six inch. I should be using an eight inch or a 10 inch broad knife or even a float, a trowel. Now I've got one out the back there, but I'm not sure if I've cleaned it up after the last time I did any concreting. So what I'm going to do is, this is a slightly different texture as well. Pop it on. And this stuff gets spread right out. We're going to cover up all of the um, imp imperfections. Now, you'll notice guys will have something that's in their hand and it, it's, it's like a, a, a pallet. It's a large square section of steel and they throw all this stuff onto that and then they use their knives to uh, put it onto the job. So first of all, I'm just going to go straight down the top. And the thing is with this coat, to take it out past all the other coats that you've done, but don't create too much of a hump in the middle. And the reason you use a larger float is it gives you more of an indication. I've got too much on there. It gives you a whole lot more control to keeping that and this almost level. You're going to have a slight rise there, but with the narrower blade, I'm, fall, I'm running the risk of falling in to those smaller sections there. And if you dawdle too much, you're going to start pulling up stuff and it's going to, you're going to get drying on there as well. That's coming up quite nice. So I'm using the other spatula to take off the excess off this one. Beautiful.
That'll do. Lovely. What we'll do next week is we'll sand that off. As I say, it's, it's dead easy to do plastering. But if you want to do it, my suggestion is, I'll switch cameras. If you want, wow, that makes it look even better. Uh, what I was going to say is if you want to do it, my suggestion is to, um, what is my suggestion? I can't do two things at once. So I'm trying to put things away and talk at the same time. Uh, yeah, do it on a test piece like this one. And so you get the hang of it rather than just go straight in and do it on a, in a room and think, oh, I've stuffed that. I think I better call someone to fix it. But there you go. That shows it a bit better like that. These things here appear bad because there's a big shadow from the light above, but it's not bad at all. That'll sand off really easy. Now with the sanding, I used my uh, six inch orbital sander and with dust extraction because it's extremely important to use dust extraction while you're doing that. Now, I'm gonna, it's called a hawk, is it? Okay, I'm gonna move that camera over to there because you guys are gonna get excited when I get to this part. What we're gonna do next is set up these two cameras opposed to each other. And I'm gonna run the jarrow through the thicknesser. And I, this takes me a little bit of time. And then we'll go over to the table saw and have a little bit of a muck around there. Okay, so have a look. Uh, right, so there we go. There's the other view you're gonna get coming out of the back of the um, machine. And I've had someone ask me, another drink, I've had someone ask me regarding my earmuffs. And these are my earmuffs. These are the ones that I have the action camera on when I, you know, whenever I'm doing close-up stuff. Now, these are also digital tuners. And I use these all the time in the workshop because I tune in to an FM broadcaster that I have built into the property here. So I can wander around this block on the mower uh, walking around doing work outside and be just fine um, regarding listening to music or whatever I have been doing outside. I might move this camera over here. Is that going to be slightly better, guys, if I tip that up a little? Out there? That's going to catch me? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, okay, so these things, I tune in. I've got a, I've got a switch box on the TV there and the sound system. So if I'm listening to music or watching the telly or whatever, you know, watching a YouTube clip, I can turn, switch over to the broadcaster and it will get picked up on this. It's just a very, very, very short distance FM broadcast. I think it's, you know, 100 meters, if that. Um, I've no idea if they're legal or not. Probably not. But uh, there you go. <laughs> All right. I've got the dust extractor down the back there. Let's turn her on. This is the piece of Jarrah that I'm going to run through the machine. Lovely, big, beautiful piece of wood. And I'm, this is an old kitchen, off an old kitchen bench. So it's got finish on it. It's got, you know, coffee mug marks on it. It's a mess. So I'll run it through this way first. I'll clean the back up. And I'll make sure that I've got... You've got to make sure when you're doing this stuff that you don't take too much off in one pass because the machine will just bog down as it's going through. That's why you see me always run timber through and sometimes you won't even, sometimes I won't even do a cut because it's I don't want to kill the machine. Turn it on. Got it. Now you can see just here and here there's a little bit taken off. It's doing beautiful. Uh, 
That's correct. That's correct. I am far enough away. I've got very good neighbours. I'm going to give it a half a turn. Unlock it. And even though that's gone back there, that's just a play that I have to do. Here we go. Take it to there, and that's not that's not a full turn. I'll turn this off for a second. Now, what I've done there, I'll kill this one as well. What I've done there, I took it a full turn, but remember, I've taken it up to the top, then locked it. The play in the control will get, roll it back down to the halfway point, down down to six o'clock at the bottom. It's not an issue. So the second time, then I took it looked like 360 but I was really only turning at 180 degrees so this next cut I have to be aware and it's always a good idea as you're feeding timber into one of these machines to stay close to these clamps because as it's going in after you've you know done your couple of skims because this is a big wide board and this is extremely extremely hard timber uh, so I may have to release that and crack it back a quarter of a turn We'll see. And it's just one of those things. You get to know your machines in time. All right. Dust again. I'll answer a quick question. Uh, my furry little mate isn't too impressed with noise your machines make. <laughs> I'm not even going there. <laughs> okay. Um, you're probably far enough, or probably remote enough not to worry about the FM as it won't annoy your neighbours. That's right. I'm my neighbour. <laughs> Here we go. Starting it up again. Watch out for your furry little mate there. That's better. Look at it. That is beautiful. I'll show you that one straight off. How nice is that? What a change. What a difference. That is a new piece of timber. Actually, that is better than a new piece of timber. And a slight snipe just there, only tiny. I can only just feel it. The other end, nothing. All right, now we're going to do the other side. See, that's that's what it used to look like. <laughs> if you saw this, you know, on the side of the road in a you know council throwout, you'd leave it there. But bloody hell, you can turn it into that. How nice! All right, nothing's illegal until you get caught, eh? <laughs> oh dear, that's an interesting interesting thought. What I'm going to do is I'm going to raise it up to there and I'm going to switch to the other camera. And you can see how efficient my four inch line is. Now, I have people saying to me, you can't have a four inch line. You must have six inch. You must have six inch on all of your machines. Well, I've got great dust control in here. I don't know what the story is. These four inch lines are working brilliantly. This is my two horse machine down there with a the cyclone on it. And I'm going to switch the camera to the other side. You will see what kind of a load this is pulling all the way through. Absolutely magic. So let's switch this camera to the other one. Where are we? There we go. Now, I need you to watch down here on the timber and up here. You'll see the volume of, uh, of dust or chip, whatever you want to call it from this jarra. Alrighty, here we go.
that didn't take all of it. We're going to go up another half a turn. Raise the table up another half a turn. There we are there. Okay, watching again. Watching again. the camera around there at the end there just to give a bit of an indication. Look at that. And flip it back to the other one again. Alright. That's just magic. I love it. How nice is that piece of Jarrah? Oh. So that's both sides, oh, sorry, both faces, all clean. If the piece, sorry, here we go. Uh, what a lovely stick, that is nice work. Do you know any vendors who export Australian hardwoods? No, I don't, Matthew. Hilton, I'm getting a fair bit of snipe on my thickness of Dave. Uh, apart from adjusting an in and out feed tables, anything else I should be looking at? Um, well, well, let me tip this up a little bit so you can see me at the same time. Um, I don't know, Zane, oh, sorry, uh, Hilton, it's one of those things that some of the machines, this one has got rollers underneath, now as in the table. So as the timber's going in, those rollers, if those rollers are adjusted up a little bit, they will... Um, they, they can create snipe as well because it tips up and then goes on to the other one and goes. Now it's also got an in-feed and an out-feed power drive rollers up the top that pull the machine in. If you can hold the timber down as you're pushing it in, so don't let the machine kick the timber up as it comes into contact with the first of the power drive going into the machine. Uh, you should be okay. I'm just checking the time there as well. We've got 15 minutes. We're traveling well today. So my suggestion as I tell everyone is with my machines, I adjust the in-feed and the out-feed table up, up a little bit, ever so slightly. So when I put the machine together, I'd have a straight edge. I can tip this down because I'm further away now. And you can see what I'm talking about. So as I say, down here, the in-feed and the out-feed table, I adjust them up ever so slightly, maybe a mil, millimeter, you know, sixteenth of an inch at the, at the absolute most. Thirty second are probably better. <clears throat> So that as you're feeding the timber in, it's maintaining that pressure down. So the rollers are going to be, you know, doing their job. The, the power feeds, I mean, as the timber comes, the, going out the other side is normally the way you have the most problem. Feeding it in, people are holding onto it and they know they can counter that little jar as the machine grabs a hold of the timber. On the outfeed, normally you're looking at the timber coming out thinking, man, that looks so nice. I'm not, <laughs> I don't care what happens, you know, this is so nice. So as it comes out the other side, the adjustment on the other side of the table sitting up a little bit is a little bit more important to me. So it holds the timber down once the timber has gone past the first power feed and only the second power feed and the cutting head are acting on it because otherwise the timber might come past the, the first power feed and do this little tip as the pressure comes off the, the power feed and tip up into the blades and that's snipe. The other way is just, you know, allow another three inches on the piece of wood and cut that piece off when you're finished, if, you, if you're having trouble with it. But there's nothing else really in there, Hilton, that's going to affect it. It's only those power rollers, because your particular machine has just got a flat sled section there. That's something else you could do if you wanted to. You could, you could make a sled out of MDF, pop the timber on with hot, um, with, you know, hot glue, or double-sided tape of some sort. You know, it's, there's all sorts of ways of anchoring timber to a sled, and I'm not going to go into that today. And put a couple of pieces in in one run so that you're not having the timber uh, finish and then the pop-up. You know what I mean? Like, if you've got a few pieces all the same thickness, run them all together, your, sec your middle sections will have no snipe. You know, the middle parts where the timbers are joining together, it'll think it's one continuous board. So that's another little tip if you need it. Now let's go over to the table saw and see if I can 
make a mess over there. And I'll talk about this other thing with, sorry about not being in the shot again for the moment while I just move this camera. I've only got so many cameras. I can't, I can't do too much more with this setup. I think that's going to work. Yet that doesn't look too bad. And I'll flip this one around this way as well so you can see where I'm headed to. <laughs> uh, still going strong, but looking forward to planning and repurposing when she's finished. Okay, well, there's a whole lot of conversation there that I haven't been a party to. So I'll keep on doing my stuff. You guys keep on doing your thing. I'll grab a square and a mitre gauge. Now this might help some of you if you want to set up your saw. But mostly this is for a panel saw. So my mitre gauge is down here. And as everyone knows, I use the INCRA. Now I also had a gentleman during the week asking about the INCRA. Um, whether or not using the mitre, mitre set control for it to line it up properly, whether there's five foul difference in the width of the mitre slot and by the time you've adjusted the INCRA. Now the INCRA has these tiny little guys here and they're an expanding disc and notice they're all on one side. They're not on the other side at all. So you can see, where are we? So they've got there, 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 and there. Those little pins relate to where those expanding discs are. You can see the disc just there. And this one just here. So they fit perfectly into the mitre set. And there's not a problem with those. They work brilliantly in the mitre set. Now, the question, Dial indicator. Let's grab the dial indicator out. These things are great if you can get a hold of one. I love them. Alrighty. Um, I'll switch over to the other camera. Where are we? Yeah, what a buzz to wake up to that video from Ron this morning. That's so nice. He's a nice guy. Ron Polk. Polk. Bench. If you need a bench that size, grab it. He does a nice job and uh, Ron's going to come over to Australia further down the track and we might hook up and have a little chat. Now, this is the dial indicator set. I don't know if you can see it there. Basically, this goes in the... Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? I've got to remember how to put the thing together. Give me a second. That has adjusters that way. Yeah, we can go straight in there. And there, where's my other arm? That's got to go onto there. This part might be boring for some people. Sorry about that. How's the chat going over there? I can't see anything because I'm way over here. <coughs> Get rid of that one. Put that one over there. And then put that about there. I think should be fine. And the other uh, machine bolt to go into there. Right. Now I can adjust this down. To about there. So you can see the setup I've got. I'm going to put this against the square like so. Now I'm going to pretend and I'll actually bring this around a little bit further and aim it straight down. That's, this is the best I can do at short notice. But I'm going to pretend that this, and I'll turn this around to naught. That's the great thing with the dial indicator. You can set it to naught. Okay, so I've got it set. Keep coming. 
to not there. Now let's pretend that this is a sliding table setup going this way. So you can see that that is running out and it'll come back to naught. Now the reason that it's running out is because I have set this to my saw blade. Okay, so there's, there's a couple of things you need to do. But this is basically, I've got it set at naught there. Now let's see if I can adjust it. If I bring it, okay. Ugh, stuff that right up because I released the stupid thing. Okay, set it back to naught. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to go naught up to there. Now if I now release the clamp and sl go slowly backwards, I should, I had to go that way. So let's go to 90 and we'll go, this is a bit of trial and error and I'll slide it backwards. I've gone too far. Let's see what happens there. That's reading a bit better. Now I've, I've moved this as well. As I say, the whole thing is if you want to, there, let's see how that goes. All right. It's, it's turning that direction as I'm going that way. So maybe I should be advancing it. This, yes, maybe that's the way. Lock it. Let's see what happens now. That's looking better. Well, not down there, it's not. But you can see what I mean. It's 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 a very interesting method. And I'm sure if I was to spend a little bit of time trying to correct it, it would be fine. That's worse, so I need to take it back. And take it back a bit further. See, the square is also lifting a little. So let's take it back to there. I'm a little bit... Oh, that is so much better. Look at that. Look at, the, look at the amount of run out we're getting there. Now I go back even a little bit further. And this should get us almost perfect. Look at that. Lift her up. Mm -hmm. And down. I like it. I like it. Right, back a little. There, I think that's going to be spot on. That is pretty good. Okay, that's enough with that. We'll move the camera back to the other position. Whoop. Not like that, we won't. <laughs> we'll switch cameras. I don't know if that one's still working or not. We'll switch this one around. All right, I think... That's going to be about it, but we'll have a quick chat. I'll run through the chat as well. Switch that back over to there. I'll move this other camera out of the way. We don't want to have another camera fun. All right, bring this out over close up, over to there, and the drink there, and back. Now that last 10 minutes, I guess, was extremely boring to everyone. There's the mouse, what am I looking for over there? But I don't know. I enjoy just slowly going through things. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I think this works well. Picture is very dark. Yes, it was. And I explained earlier in the video why the picture is very dark in that particular one. I'm getting, I wanted to show a contrast on, um, on the mud board when I was putting the setting compound on. So uh, I was reading something else that was coming through as well. 
All right, where are we? Coming back down through to here. Yes, okay. Again, interesting to see the gravity overcoming centrifugal force as the chips pass through the bend in the hose. Hilton, thanks, Dave and Peter. I'll try your ideas. Um, Peter, Hilton, please don't forget to use some hot glue between the boards. Otherwise, it would be very dangerous. Yes, exactly right. Uh, Zane, picture is very dark. Doug, uh, a little too dark, Dave. Yes, Zane, too early in the morning to have to think about that much. You are making my head hurt. Uh, trying to work the angles out. And I bought myself a magnetic dial indicator to check my machines, but I'm a bit confused as to how to use it. Didn't come with any instructions. You make it look easy, Dave. Well, I don't make it look easy because, um, because it just comes to be easy. I had to spend a lot of time nutting it all out, and I can try and pass that information on to you. Uh, Dave M, how many thousandths travel do you end up with there? There's Probably, I, I reckon there would have been around eight thou at the end there when I was getting really close. Now, that's over. That that's that's not great, but you know, it's one of those things. I'm holding onto a square, which can move. I've got a force of the spring. I've, I'm trying to travel past the pressure that the miter gauge is actually applying through those expanding discs into the miter slot. Everything's working against me. The whole idea of was trying to show people that is a, an option if you want to set 90 degrees up to a mitre gauge on a sliding table, the, the European style of saw. Um, James West, Oz Scarborough Production. Hi, Dave. How are you? Barry, your wife. Did everyone's very well. Doug, in my earlier working life as an electronics tech, I'd say we use the same gauge called an eccentricity gauge which we used to fit to the old beta video heads to correct center. Wow. Uh, thanks, John. <laughs> Great. In fact, your saw, of, of course, will not take a sliding table because <laughs> it's too small. Uh, Zane, didn't you do a vid on setting the miter gauge to the fence with the dial indicator? Yes, I did. Now, on that video, this is just, just an aside. What I did there, uh, yes, we are Blue Mountains, correct. What I did with that video was I showed you measuring to the teeth. Now, ideally, what I would have done is painted one of those teeth white and I would have rotated the tooth from the front back to the back. So I'd have the dial indicator set front and back and it would be measuring exactly the same tooth because that would also tell me whether the thing is out and whether there's any run out in the arbor. There's a whole lot of mucking around that if you want to go down deeper into the saw, uh, to test whether the saw is okay or faulty. If you, you can actually run that dial indicator down in and on top of the arbor and rotate with everything turned off, obviously no saw on there at all, and it will tell you amazing secrets about how good your saw is or, or not good as the case may be. Mine is average as far as the arbor run out is concerned, but I can normally set the blade up to run really nicely. The only thing is if you have a bit of run out, you will get more chipping on surfaces, hard surfaces such as melamine, as the blade is wobbling a little bit and it will, um, yeah, if, if a dead straight cut is a whole lot better than any wobble. All right. Um, uh, Minister for Home Affairs saying, my leave pass is about to expire, so I guess it's time to get the paint roller out of the freezer and get back to work. Okay. Okay, and thanks for dropping in and uh, affiliating. And for everyone who does the, the not the affiliate, the moderating, everyone who does the moderating for me, thank you so much. Um, Hilton, I'll keep practicing, Dave. I'll work it out. Uh, Dave, and thanks for taking the time to demo these things. Very informative and helpful. Dave, Jarrah, available in the US. I don't know. I don't, you'll have to ask people in the States regarding whether Jarrah is available over there. I think it is, but it's just one of those things. Dave, I've never seen Jarrah in the US. Man, oh man, it's a beautiful timber and it's so easy to work with and stays dead straight. I love it, love it, love it. Okay, guys, as it's, uh, thank you for watching. Thanks for uh, doing everything you do. Like I, I do this stuff, but you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be even here or possible if you guys weren't watching and, and uh, encouraging me. 
So thanks again for watching. And everyone, I shall see you next week or even before next week. Hopefully I'll get another video out during the week. Thanks again. Bye.